All three of our panelists are accounted for and here. And so I wanna go ahead and invite them onto the stage. Uh, the focus today is really around building an inclusive ecosystem for investing and the ways in which all of the uh, entrepreneur support organizations work together to help uplift uh, and build up investment spaces in our communities. Um, and so we're gonna hear from some outstanding people today. Uh, Faye Horwitz is the president of Forward Cities, which is a national organization focused on building inclusive ecosystems, entrepreneurial ecosystems um, in communities across the country. The other thing is they have a, a particular focus on investment. We also have Sylvester Mobley, who is the co-founder and leader of Coded by Kids, uh, which is an organization that really is developing the technical, the technical capabilities of our young people, but also creating a pipeline of entrepreneurs to really solve and tackle some of the issues within our community and really offer some innovation in the world. So we are excited to have him with us today. So thank you for joining us, Sylvester. Um, and then what I will also mention is we have Dominic with us. Uh, Dominic Art of Act House in Tulsa is doing some really breakthrough work in terms of offering some accelerator programs. He has a really interesting model around equity and what that looks like for communities and entrepreneurs of color. Uh, so we're excited to hear from him and some of the really innovative ways he's helping to um, uplift the community. Uh, and so Faye will be with us shortly, but I want to go ahead and, and kick off the conversation with you two. And I'll start with you, Dominic. Uh, one, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity really just to introduce yourself, let people know about the work that you're doing and um, why you're excited to be here today. Yeah, well, Matt, thanks for, thanks for having me and, and to the Hustle community. I really appreciate it. Uh, you all allowed me to join you all today. Uh, really excited to be here. Uh, it's great when we can have true facilitated conversations like this that really bring forth insights and understanding. Uh, so really excited to be a part of uh, the conversation. Uh, I'm Dominic Artis, founder and CEO of Act House. Uh, we're a global platform for team formation and startup creation. And in short, what that means is that we help innovators find their uh, innovation identity, help them balance teams through our Act model, and help them accelerate their dreams through our accelerator programs. Uh, one of our accelerators is actually uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, highly focused on uh, increasing the equity of Black and Latinx-led startups, uh, which is really, really, really exciting. Uh, we just finished up our first cohort uh, last week, actually, December 31st, they finished, but Demo Day was uh, last week, which is pretty outstanding, and welcome to the second cohort, where we're making $70,000 investments into those startups with 0% interest, 0% equity at a 1x return. Um, it's really exciting. We'll talk more about that. Um, but we do that work, and we also do a lot of exciting work with our assessment, um, our ACT models, architects, creatives, and techies. We've been really studying teams for the past four years, really thinking about how teams will form, how innovation begins to accelerate. And oftentimes within people, product, and process, we spend a lot of time talking about process and product, not necessarily about people. And I believe when you look at the ground floor of innovation ecosystems, uh, when you can begin to focus on people, uh, you can really begin to see those innovation ecosystems begin to accelerate. Uh, so I'm really excited to do that through cross-cultural collaboration. So thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, no problem. So excited to hear more from you too, Dominic. So Bester, I'll let you go ahead and give us a little bit about the work you're doing and your background. Yeah, thank you. Um, really, really good to be here. I um, really appreciate the opportunity. I, so I'm the CEO and founder of Coded by Kids, but also the founder or co-founder and co-managing partner of Plainsight Capital. Um, Coded by Kids is a tech and innovation organization. Um, what we really focus on is how do you take the same processes, systems, and tools used in sports to produce high-performing, extremely talented, high-potential athletes and apply it to the startup space. Mm -hmm. So we look more like a youth sports organization in a lot of ways than a traditional education organization in the sense that we look to get kids as young as possible we go from eight to 24. We're not like a two week workshop or three week workshop organization. Um, one of our, our metrics or one of the goals we work to is to keep a, a person that comes into Coded by Kids for at least three to four years. Wow. And the same way a kid 
is at basketball practice week after week over the course of multiple years. We do the same thing. So, you know, the, the young people that we work with are learning everything from software development, user experience design to how, you, how do you raise venture capital. And the idea is there's a very intentional development and, and grooming process. I love that. And then on the plain sight capital side, it's how do we invest early stage venture capital into underrepresented founders? Um, a lot of underrepresented founders struggle at that, that early stage. They don't have the networks. They're not able to raise those pre-seed and seed rounds. And that's where we come in. And we also look to lead pre-seed rounds for, for underrepresented founders. Um, so it's, it's also helpful to have a venture capital fund that's run by former underrepresented founders that yeah. understand where you've been, you know, what you're going through and the obstacles that you're facing. Absolutely. I love it. It's, it's an end-to-end -end program. And I love that you all have borrowed the brilliance from youth sports to offer some intensity that coaching and support that people need. Faith, I want you to go ahead and, and share a little bit about the work that you're doing at Forward Cities. This is also one of our co-founders of Hustle. So it's great to have you back on the stage. Uh, I remember the genesis of this program and, and look at where it is now. So excited to hear from you and all the things that you've got going on. Yeah, thank you, Matt. It is, it's a, a bit surreal um, be, being with you all, being a guest of Hustle, um, you know, after a few years, a uh, few years removed. But so excited for um, you all and thank you for the invitation to, to come and participate. Uh, so, you know, I cut my, my teeth in, in Winston-Salem in the field of entrepreneurial ecosystem building. I didn't even know what it was at the time. Uh, and, and in that work and my experience there, I began to understand that there were so many more dynamics above a level above the uh, even the entrepreneur level, but then there's the entrepreneurial support level, but then the ecosystem level. And that's when I started to realize that um, it's fractal. And so this idea of inequity exists at all three of those levels. Mm -hmm. And and where I believed and where I found I could have my um, greatest impact is to work uh, at the ecosystem level. And ecosystem level then uh, uh, across communities, because the inequities that I saw, um, I felt like that they were just in my hometown. I thought this town is jacked up. <laughs> Honestly, it's the way I felt. I was like, there's something off and wrong about what's happening here. And I wanted it to be better. And I felt like that, that we were fighting an uphill battle. And, and so, you know, I had the opportunity to be able to, to uh, do this work on a national level. And I began to to visit and see communities across the country and realize that, no, this is not about one place. This is, this is not only systemic, um, but it, is, it, is, it doesn't matter what size of city, it doesn't matter um, you know, uh, whether or not it's rural or it's, it's a center city, this is, this is pervasive, right? And so my, my work and the work that Forward Cities does is, a, is around how do we um, rise up to that level and understanding that there's an entrepreneur level, there is an entrepreneurial support level, but thinking about the holistic system and how can you equip uh, the system to address inequities? Mm -hmm. And that is the work that Forward Cities does. So we work across the country in communities. We've worked in over 30 communities uh, you know, across the country. And essentially what we do is we engage with entrepreneurial ecosystem builders that are, that are at the grassroots level, that are already serving um, and trying to do the work essentially that I was trying to do in Winston-Salem, right? And feeling the same thing that I was feeling, which is, this is, t this is freaking hard. I feel like that we're like uphill battle. I need support. I don't know how to do this. Um, what do I do? And yeah. that's who we work with. Um, we engage and contract or hire those folks um, we do wraparound support and training for them to equip them to sort of do this work in community. And then we give them the resources and tools to do that. So we provide, um, we have a research and, and metrics team, which provides surveys uh, and, and program evaluation. We have a marketing storytelling team um, and communications team that helps them tell the stories in local community and emerge and, and sort of, uh, you know, uh, share an ident brand identity for the community if needed. Uh, and then most importantly, um, we have community innovation team, which helps them do the work that, that I was attempting to do, which is how do you how do you convene the players together? 
How do you get them on the same page? How do you get them to review the, the data and understand the needs and the barriers and the challenges of underrepresented entrepreneurs? And not only that, it's not just about understanding and about um, planning, but it's about doing something. And so often what I found in ecosystems is that groups of people, they'll have a council, they come together, they sit around in the room and they say, this is what my organization is doing. This is what my organization is doing. What are you doing? And they all sort of like then have a meal together and go home and then nothing gets done. And yeah. so our work is about moving into action. How do we get these folks collaborating together and aligned and not um, overlapping and duplicating services? How do we make sure that they, they are collaboratively working together for shared funding, um, which makes a greater impact? Uh, and so that's the work that Forward Cities does. And we're excited also to be leaning into a new Black Wall Street Forward initiative. Um, Love it, which I want to hear more about in a moment. We'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> So I want to give folks an opportunity to really hear more about some of the specific strategies and programs that you all are getting off the ground. So, Dominic, I'm going to start with you because cool. there's an interesting philosophy coming out of Act House around guiding. Essentially, it's uh, raising equity, taking none. That's the program yeah. that you all have developed. And I want to know what makes this important for advancing black and brown entrepreneurship. Yeah, well, I, I'll tell you this. So my background kind of provides a unique lens into like the entrepreneurial ecosystem perspective. Um, and a portion of that background is in urban regional. And when you kind of talk about how multi-tiered and multi-layered these ecosystems are and how you have to begin to kind of address it from most, multiple different angles, uh, that was something that was very important to us. And as one that started in co-living incubation um, and that accelerator as well, uh, one thing that we thought diligently about is like the breadth of what's happening in the ecosystem. How do we begin to support, but furthermore, um, how do we begin to accelerate uh, the impact of these particular founders um, in order to come at the table with more skin in the game. When you're dealing with early stage pre-seed companies, uh, there's not much from an evaluation standpoint besides product and the team uh, that kind of give you a good landscape to begin to evaluate from. And so then when you start to look at the landscape of uh, the family and friend round of, uh, I think, Kaufman produced a report where it showed roughly about anywhere from five to about $25,000 or $35,000 um, is really the average of what you see in most Black and Latinx communities when it comes to the family and friend round, comparably to uh, their counterparts in predominantly white communities. Uh, that family and friend round extends from about $85,000 to $115,000, right? Wow. And so... As we kind of saw, um, you know, a lot of uh, the philanthropic market, um, high net worth individuals wanted to tackle this problem um, a little bit more effectively. Uh, we thought about how can we begin to raise the value of the equity uh, by taking that and being that family and friend around one next year. Uh, the beautiful thing in that is um, we've been able to actually see great progress in that. We accepted nine companies in our first cohort. Um, our program is six months, three months incubation, three months implementation for our accelerator. Um, and by December 31st, which was the end of the, um, the end of the accelerator for cohort one, we had two companies already trigger their, uh, their initial return of 70,000, right? So two companies trigger that. We'll have another company trigger um, by March 15th um, of triggering that $70,000 back. And I'm pretty sure roughly about two or three more are lined up kind of four to five months post-program, right? Well, so I wanna make sure I'm following Dominic. It sounds yeah. like, you all um, invest in the companies uh, by taking no equity, but primarily providing support services. And as that company starts to see growth and their yeah. value increases, yeah. then yeah. that's where you say, okay, now is an opportunity to start to think about yeah. building it. Okay. For sure. It's definitely just off of a trigger of revenue and also uh, the amount of capital that's been raised. Right. And so, because once, once they hit that certain trigger, then they're able to actually um, work out a plan to actually begin to reinvest that 70,000. And the reality is that 70,000 is now coming back to the cohort that's coming in. And so we raised a $5 million fund in order to do that. Um, but what it also does is for us and also for the other growing uh, venture markets that are actually taking place um, is that it provides them with more well-prepared um, Black and Latinx startups to actually fund. Right, invest in. 
And so we focus our efforts in that space, uh, which is really exciting. And um, probably down the road, we've already kind of have it prepared. We're just wondering, should we press go or not? Uh, to just kind of raise a venture fund and really begin to accelerate that impact even more. Uh, I love but it. nonetheless, there's a lot of other ecosystem players that are uh, participating in that work. For us, we want to make sure that the entrepreneur, the founder, the innovator is coming to the table, uh, knowing how to negotiate, knowing how to really begin to um, understand unit economics, the value proposition, and begin to scale their business to the next level. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Amen. So... Faye, I want you to talk a little bit about um, the collaborative ways you've seen entrepreneur support organizations provide capital and market opportunities for black and brown founders. Yeah, thank you um, for sharing that. And, and, you know, one of the interesting things about the way we work is that Forward Cities, uh, we, we never come into community and tell them what they should do. Um, this is this is about we work collaboratively with community. And so we we employ surveys and they tell us what the needs are. Um, often we hear uh, that ca obviously capital is is one of the needs that rises to the top. Um, but we also often hear that there are other challenges. And so what we do is uh, capital is not always what they want to prioritize. They may think that it's something else. But where where, where we have uh, led and where we tend to think about our capital work is how can we in be innovative? Because it is not, uh, for us, it's not about uh, the ability to get more access to what already, already exists. Like we know these things exist. For us, it's about how can we uh, engage different partners in the community and the councils we work in to emerge new solutions. Um, and so we, we, we uh, engage them in a collaborative design process where they are able to share, hey, based on what the data is telling us around what entrepreneurs are saying they need or don't need related to capital, what can we either build on? Can, can we look at what's working across the country? Can we bring that here? Or if there's not something that fits the needs that we've identified, can we create and design something new that would address the needs, the specific needs of our community? Yes. Uh, we're going through this right now um, in Indianapolis. Um, where we have uh, the need was was emerged. Number one, they need capital. And so we have a group of 15 organizations uh, that we all ask to submit ideas. What can you what could your community do together to help, uh, you know, increase access to equitable, uh, increase equitable access to capital? Um, we had, you know, uh, nearly 10 ideas submitted from that group. Um, and from the from Forward Cities, based on our background and, and experience and work we've done in other communities, today they are voting on uh, which of those ideas they want to move into design process. Um, one or two ideas, and J.P. Morgan Chase has agreed to fund whatever idea emerges from this group. Um, wow. And what's what's exciting about that is we get to pilot something uh, new, and this community gets to have ownership of this. Um, it came from them. It is. It is. It belongs to them. It emerged. Black people, we have our solutions. We we know. <laughs> Black and brown people, we've been finding our own solutions for a long time. What we haven't had is funding. So this idea of being able to to uh, marry our ingenuity uh, with funding support for this work is huge. And so that's that's one of the things. One of the ways we were leaning into it, and we're excited about. I love it. I absolutely love it. I love the emphasis on identifying best practice. I love the idea of involving members of the community to really drive a solution that they could own and that they can run with. So, Bester, I want to go with you now uh, because you have a really interesting philosophy around um, diversity and inclusion policies and how sometimes they can miss the mark when it comes to building an inclusive ecosystem for investing in black and brown founders. Um, would you share just a little bit about that and, um, you know, what, what, what does that mean to you? And also, what are some alternatives that we need to consider? Yeah, so th there's a few things that, that I've found in my, in my work. One, often when we're talking about um, underrepresented people, especially Black and, and, and Latinx people, it's talked about in the sense of, you know, more of a, a problem to solve. We're not talking about people who have opportunity, uh, you know, people who have value to add. I'll sit in conversations with people um, 
in, in government, with people who are in corporations. And it's like this, if we just get these black kids a job, then they're not creating problems for the city. You know, we're not, it's not a, a, a matter of like, hey, these are people with, with real value. Um, and we're often setting the bar at employment. In a lot of large cities, when you hear the dialogue and the conversation, anything that's related to the tech space, it's how do we push as many Black people into a certification program as we can to get them into jobs, not how do we prepare them to be employers, how do we prepare them to start and, and build startups. So a lot of the work I do, a lot of you know what I'm talking about is how do we push back against that, that narrative? Um, in the beginning of the history of our, our organization, we got a lot of pushback from funders because funders would say, well, not all of your, your, your kids are going to be CEOs or CTOs and not all of your kids are going to start companies. And my response was always like, well, you know, I'm a pretty practical person. And yes, you're absolutely right. Not all of our, our, our kids are going to do that. However, I set the bar at preparing them to be CEOs and CTOs. I set the bar at preparing them to be founders. So if I fail, what happens? My kids end up as VP of product somewhere or director of engineering somewhere. You set the bar at employment. So if you fail, your failure looks very different than, than my failure. We do the same thing when we talk about entrepreneurship. You know, I can look across the city of Philadelphia where, where we're based. There are tons of programs targeting underrepresented people that all focus on small business. There's nothing that focuses on how do we prepare underrepresented people to start and build scalable high growth companies, which to me is a missed opportunity. So we try to focus on those things. We try to focus on how do we work with people? How do we prepare people? How do we support people to go as far as absolutely possible without us being the thing that's limiting their potential, which so often is what happens. Wow. When I tell you, I feel watered by the comments from all of you. I mean, just so empowered and inspired by the work that's happening within these ecosystems, within your organization. Um, Faye and Dominic, both of you have assessments that you offer to ecosystems. Can you tell us about those? Yeah, Mac, before, before we go there, I, I just want to jump to Sylvester's comment uh, specifically. Yeah. There's, Faye said a lot of things, Sylvester said some, some great things as well. Um, that comment around um, the, the bar, right? And where we're setting that bar. I think it's so important because I think the culmination of not only us, you know, who are on this panel, but other ecosystem builders that are doing uh, the work to create more inclusive ecosystems for black, whites, Asians, and Malaysians, right? It's, it's, it's really around perception change of how we see black and Latinx um, individuals within the Americas um, as value creators, as um, economy movers, as influencers. And I think the core of the work that we're doing is really touching and addressing that beyond measure. Uh, but I just wanted to say that first. Faith, you kick it to the assessment so then we can, I'll kick back and go after you. But I just wanted to make sure we, we really kind of put that out. As a, as a plus point. one to it, plus one. I think, especially within a capitalist structure where black and brown bodies have been exploited as we've seen in the video, solely for our labor. So what yeah. you're saying, no, we are creators. We actually build economies. We build communities. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so this is a beautiful conversation. I, I, I'll tag on, begin by tagging onto that, this idea of, um, we think about it from the standpoint of asset-based uh, economic development. Like this is a business development. We, we are done with the deficit language and thinking about how can we speak to um, who our assets as uh, we start there, right? Um, we start with the assets. Yes, we acknowledge barriers, and we are our, our, the work that we do is about removing barriers, but the assets are unlimited, right? Once the barriers are removed, and that's the work that we do is that, is that like we are, uh, we want to make sure that we can achieve our full potential, and there's nothing holding us back. Yeah. And absolutely. when we think about, you know, forward cities, often we think about and talk about the fact that it's hard to change something that you can't measure. 
um, and you're not able to, to really understand where it sits. Because if you don't know where you're starting, it's really hard to, to chart a path to where you want to go. And so we've developed a, a few tools to do that. Um, we have one of the tools that we use is called our E3 scorecard and E3 stands for equity for every entrepreneur. And, and this, this scorecard essentially, essentially is, a, is a tool for, for conversation and healing and that, that sparks action. And so we've laid out these, these multiple elements that make for a healthy and equitable ecosystem. Uh, and they're in the categories of people, um, programs, networks, and narratives. And each of those has its own sort of subcategory and, and elements. But this idea of getting different people, both entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial support providers in a, in a community to take this assessment, um, we use Qualtrics to, to collect the data, um, or and or we can do it as a focus group and a large event where we'll come to, uh, get the data in real time. But it allows the ecosystem to see itself for everyone to be able to see how this, sort of this collective vision, collective understanding of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and gaps. And so if you, if you think about, if they're able to all see it, then they can begin to have a real, a, an authentic conversation about here's where we are, here are the things where, here's where we're working well, and here are things, and, and here's the thing, it's one or the other. Either you're working well and, and our work can help you figure out, four years to help you figure out how to sort of triple the impact, exponentially increase the impact of what's working well, or if there are things that are, that are jacked up and not working, we will help you figure out how to remove that barrier and address it so that, so that you can sort of begin to increase equity in your ecosystem. And we've now um, deployed this, this uh, scorecard uh, in over 10 communities across the country. And we're, we're looking at more communities to, to join us. And it's a free tool. We make it available. If you're an ecosystem builder out there that wants to understand this and help your community understand this, um, you know, you can go to our website and look at scorecard and we can help you get started on that journey because that's the beginning. Um, people who fund this work, they care about data. They want to, they will care about numbers and understanding and measurement. And so you can't go in there and say, Hey, it's, it's, it's because it's right. Because <laughs> it's moral, because, you know, it they, not work. if that was going to work, it would have worked before now. It is not. Yeah. Um, and so we, we start with the data and we help you tell the, 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 the narrative um, of the numbers. Yeah. So kind of picking back in that space, you know, as Faye kind of pointed out so eloquently in the beginning, you know, ecosystems are layered, right? There's um, just like business, people process product. You have program, place, and people when it comes to innovation ecosystems. And so for our assessment, and just like in my years of looking at innovation ecosystems, working in the backgrounds of Chattanooga, Miami, Rochester, New York, uh, Birmingham, um, we started just think through like people. Faith made a comment earlier about oftentimes ESOs We'll sometimes meet around the room and just say, hey, we're doing this, we're doing that. And I was a part of that conversation. And, you know, one moment was just like, OK, well, what are we doing to really understand the innovators that we're serving? And so when we thought about how could we do that, our team model, architects, creatives and techies, um, we began to really test that over the past four years from our accelerator to hackathons with Apple, John Deere, Thurgood Marshall College Fund. And to provide some just quick data on it. Um, the very first year they actually put on that hackathon in 2016, roughly about three day sprint, um, all people, people developing, uh, platforms or well, apps on the IO platform. Um, 20 teams formed, only two out of 20 teams were uh, developed prototypes. So we started to kind of examine the problem. We looked at, well, how did teams form? And CB Insights produced a very good report in 2017 around team formation uh, being the top three reasons, or one of the top three reasons of the 20 reasons why entrepreneurs fail. Um, we started to think through, okay, well, how can we deploy our act model and test it? And so uh, we allowed everybody who was at the hackathon when they formed teams, uh, you had to have an architect, you had to have a creative, you had to have a techie. And the architect is more the business mind, the creative is more the design mind, the techie is more the programmer within tech verticals and tech enabled verticals. Uh, so they formed teams, you could have one of each, but you, you had to have one of each, but you could have two of each. But 16 out of 20 teams formed prototypes on the iOS platform that year in 2017. The year after that, uh, 19 out of 20. And because we were just so kind of gully and greedy, we wanted to see if we can actually get to that 20 out of 20. 
Uh, and, and we did, which is very exciting. Uh, but now we have a psychological assessment that really begins to help us understand um, who's an architect, creative, or techie, uh, the innovation mindset. So there's been a lot of conversation around the entrepreneurial mindset, but innovation ecosystems are not just within communities, with, they're within corporations, they're within other environments. And so our test really begins to, our assessment really begins to help people understand what they gravitate to. Do they gravitate as an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, right? And then last but not least, uh, team fit, right? Like really looking at uh, collaboration style, communication style, um, understanding compromise. And so uh, we're in a pretty aggressive beta in that right now. It's been tracking extremely, extremely, extremely well. Um, I'll actually just like share, Matt, you can share that link with everybody sure. um, in the audience, but um, the end results are not necessarily connected to it, but our team will be more than happy to share your results with you. But it's one where if we can begin to address innovators on the ground floor, then the work that Faye, Sylvester, myself, other ecosystem players are doing can really be amplified. And oftentimes there's a lot of tools like out there for Myers-Briggs and uh, strength finders that help, you know, just everyday individuals and workers understand um, their, their kind of identity and where they kind of grow to. But for us, we wanted to help the in innovators understand their innovation identity, but then also get them to the place of collaboration and team fit, uh, because that's what matters more than anything. If you, the dream can't work if the team's not working. And right. so you need the team to make the dream work for sure. What I love, if I could just connect a couple of dots here is, you know, we have Faye and the work at Forward Cities really working with those ecosystem players to look at what are we doing as an entire community? How do we yeah. prepare ourselves to welcome this innovation? What I love about the work you're doing, Dominic and Sylvester, is it's really on the individual level, right? How can we equip you with the capabilities? How can I give you the mindset um, that will really allow you to know how to mobilize resources, how you to really capitalize on your ideas, and then also ground them in community and, and solve problems and be okay. in the world. So just, I, I love the work and how it all fits together. So this is why this matters. And so I just want folks to understand like the people who we have on this panel right now are some incredible players really moving us forward. Sylvester, I wanna to come to you because you were recently named one of Ford's um, 50 champions uh, for the amazing work that you're doing at Coded by Kids. Uh, but can you also share the vision that you have for One Philadelphia? which I think is a really interesting model and how it plays a role in creating an inclusive ecosystem. Um, so uh, this is an interesting conversation because, you know, I'm listening to, to Faye and loving everything that she's talking about, because in a lot of ways, One Philadelphia is that work. Um, we found ourselves in a unique position as an organization because, you know, while we are an education nonprofit, we, we've always straddled this line between education, startup space, and tech. So it put us in a different place than a lot of other nonprofits in our region. And we started to look at the ecosystem, especially as I started to move into the, okay, now I'm going to be a fund manager. What do we need in the ecosystem for viable, scalable companies that are growing? And just started digging into why things aren't changing. Um, you know, Pew does a report every year for the city of Philadelphia, and it's the state of Philadelphia. And every year, the poverty numbers never change, and people are asking why. Um, you know, we operate in Delaware that experiences some of the same problems, and in New Jersey, it's experiencing some of the same problems. And we started to just go, you know, level after level, what's happening here that's resulting in things not changing. Because if you look at a lot of these problems across the country, we are investing a lot of money into it. A part of the problem is we're investing money into symptoms of, of the problem. We're never actually addressing the roots of the problem. You know, so, so we're doing this thing where it's almost like you're treating someone with cancer by giving them brain uh, or by giving them painkillers without ever treating the, the, the cancer. Um, and that's what we do over and over. So we just kept going level after level saying, what needs to be fixed here to drive the change we want? And then let's go a level down, what needs to be fixed here to drive the change that we want? So we started pulling together partners across the ecosystem that honestly have nothing to do with tech or the startup space. You know, we started reaching out to, to 
you know, organizations and programs that do literacy education programs, because essentially what we said was, well, we can't build scalable startups if people are at a sixth grade reading level or, you know, people are struggling with, with math comprehension. We started reaching out to college prep organizations saying, hey, if we work together with the intentional effort of building an innovation ecosystem, how can you support that? Because ultimately we, we want, you know, people going to, to the college and higher education. So it, it was really, if we looked across the ecosystem and started pulling all of the pieces together to start addressing the things that have prevented us from moving forward, what does it look like? And, you know, that's really what One Philadelphia is. And, and also recognizing an innovation ecosystem is more than innovation. You know, at one point, one of our funders asked, you know, why are you having conversations with people who are working around sustainable housing and food insecurity? And I was like, well, we can't have a sustainable innovation ecosystem if people are unsecure in terms of housing and people can't feed themselves and their children. This all has to to work together, but no one ever thinks about these things working to, together, unfortunately, except for Faye. Um, that's why I've been really excited listening to, to Faye talk. Um, but, you know, that's what One Philadelphia is. And, you know, the idea was, if you look at cities like Philadelphia, because I talk about this in other cities, you don't have one city. The city looks very different depending on what you look like in the neighborhood that you live in. And at some point, to to really reach the ideals that we say we have we have to build one city i love it i love it this idea of convening those important stakeholders to really drive that systemic change that we need dominic were you about to build on that yeah no i think you know, sylvester made a, a very good point as far as especially from a sustainable housing component when we started the act house and really began to look at okay how do you begin to help innovators on the ground floor like housing is a crucial element to feeling secure in order to actually create and innovate, right? And so when people are worried about um, job security in order to actually bring in capital in order to make sure that they're fine, right? When you start to think about the user experience of the innovator, um, you, you kind of put them in this position post undergraduate, post-grad school, student loan debt, do I have to get a job or do can I get into the creator economy? Well, if I get into the creator economy, how many 1099 contract positions can I actually begin to leverage in order to take care of the principal while I can begin to expand on the creative side? And that was the core thing from the beginning. Like, how do we address this from a play standpoint uh, with Act House and thinking about how can we begin to address innovators from a housing component and beginning to lower the rate of rent through co-living in order to actually provide them not only people to really begin to build and connect with, but also like financial uh, incentives um, in order to actually help them with the key thing that matters most, which is like security. Like it's a basic need, it's Maslow's, right? So if you don't begin to address it um, on that level, you, you're gonna miss out. So like the things that Sylvester and Faye are speaking of in relationship to the multiple elements of housing policy and then sustainability and, and these other components, reading, comprehension, it's critical, right? Because uh, all that goes into the that want to see when it comes to the innovation ecosystems. Absolutely. Matt. Oh, go ahead. I, I just wanted to say one thing um, based on what Dominic was saying. Uh, it, it, you know, it's interesting. I was talking to one of our funders at a large institution who said to me at one point, the most talented Black people all work here because none of them can afford to start their own thing. And that's what often happens. Our talent, because we're saddled with student loan debt, because you know, you need to be able to raise capital and support yourself and have secure housing. We don't have that 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 security or that safety net to go out and build something. So our talent ends up getting siphoned off and going to work at institutions and, and organizations. Wow. And one, and one resource to add to that for people who are, who kind of need to see some of the fuller understanding of um, like what shapes communities, which in shapes innovation ecosystems. Um, this, I remember reading this book before it, it really got hot. So I'm, I'm kind of happy about that just as an urban planning note, but 
uh, The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. Uh, two things I love. One, I love that um, it was it was someone that didn't look like me that wrote this text. <laughs> and then two, it was such a very objective measure of looking at where these things began to start from a housing policy component and then how to begin to shape the transfer of wealth and the lack of transfer of wealth uh, for many denizens of the, of the United States. Right. And so um, it's a very important read to kind of just get a good global picture of how up, but I just want to share that with the audience so you guys can can check that out too. Yes, foundational text. I was yeah. talking with uh, my pastor about that. I mean, that right there, it it completely changes the game and just shifts your perspective. So I want to invite some questions from the audience. So I'll give some folks to start to populate our chat um, with with some of your questions so that we can pose them to the panelists, but. While we're waiting on folks to do that, I want to do a quick round robin. So literally kind of spitfire, one minute responses, if you can. Um, what are some recommended strategies uh, entrepreneurial support organizations and communities can adopt to create a more inclusive environment for investing? If you had to give them one strategy right now, what would it be? Uh, Dominic, you want to kick us off? I'm, I'm leading with faith. I'm going with faith first. Okay, cool. <laughs> Okay, so you had had to start there. Um, uh, so I will say, uh, y'all are too brilliant for me. Now I'm trying to I'm trying to say something that would uh, would resonate. But I would say, deep listening Critical. is what comes to me. Um, there we we are we are all very smart. We all we all understand this work. We know um, the 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 strategy. Sometimes we can get caught up in that and and we can rely on on our own lived experience and our own sort of uh, expertise. But often what I find is that when you just slow down uh, and stop trying to do and stop trying to, you know, create the thing, make the thing happen and you just be still and listen. Entrepreneurs entrepreneurial support organizations, even the ecosystem as a whole will, will tell you they even sometimes if it's a whisper, will tell you what they need. And you have to slow down enough to recognize that, to hear it, to, to soak it in and to, to honor that. Um, because even though there are patterns, even though there's systemic issues, um, people are still people. They need to be heard. They need to know that you are not seeing them as a number or a project or a um, the, the, a potential solution, but as a human being. So you know, be an ecosystem whisperer is is what I would say. Yes, love it. Um, yep. Take uh, they provided the the theology and the philosophy, so I, I'll I'll hit the. Um, the pieces, and this was said earlier, like data, right? Like, and and don't get caught up in the vanity metrics. Like, let's truly look at what is really happening up under the uh, up under the shell. I think that's just so important to understand the vibrancy and the health of the ecosystem. You have to understand the vibrancy and health of the people, and also the vibrancy and health of that company, right? Uh, so I think that's definitely key. And I would also say for other for ESOs, I find this often uh, when I facilitated a group probably back in 2014, if I'm not mistaken, I asked them one question. Out of the 14 organizations, how many of you all talk to entrepreneurs every every month? And then I went to every week, and then I went to every day. If you are not talking to entrepreneurs on a consistent basis, innovators on a consistent basis, entrepreneurs on a consistent basis, like daily, um, and not just like, give me this data, but understanding what's going on with them, you're not serving your customer, right? Like. You have a customer as an ESO, it's that innovator, it's that entrepreneur, like do right by that, those people all the time. Got it. Sylvester. Yeah, I, I would say not treating the work like charity. Um, Critical. Often anything that's in this space, people treat it like, you know, it's a handout or it's charity instead of what it is, you know, 
whether it's through actual capital, whether it's through programming, whether it's through support, we're investing in people who have a lot of talent. They have a lot of potential and a lot of value to add. To me, that's not charity. That's it's just a good economic decision. There's value in it, and that's the way it needs to to be treated. Mm. Love it. So powerful. Um, here's another question. In your experience, you know what? I'm gonna pause on this one. Um, have you all seen alternative funding uh, from equity, such as? debt, lending circles, CDFIs work better for communities of color? And do you believe that uh, ESO should work more toward these models or sort of seeking some alternative solutions in terms of how we fund entrepreneurs of color? Yeah, I'll, I'll tee up. I don't necessarily have a specific examples, but I have some specific thinking around it. So Sylvester said something that's very important, like to the funder and the and the ESO that's actually doing the work, like you can't treat it like charity, right? Like what's the value proposition? What's the model? Like you should be looking at the capital as a way to just jumpstart what you're doing in order to make it sustainable, right? And that comes from the activities and the work. Um, I do believe that those financial mechanisms uh, that are out there um, all have particular requirements and we've evaluated and looked at a lot of them, um, but understand that, you know, if you're not speaking the unit economics of that capital stack and structure that you're you're going after, it's just not going to work. And so I, I don't fault the capital as much as I fault the uh, the programmatic or the intervention uh, and the design of that intervention. That's probably not human centered at all um, or not culturally centered towards the particular group that it's actually going after. And so those would just be my, my general thoughts on it. I want to get some clear clarification. You said unit economics for that stack. Yeah, capital stack. So, like, if you're if you're looking at um, garnering money from a CDFI, right? There's particular requirements. There's particular process. There's particular uh, data points that are needed and necessary in order for you to capture dollars. Compared to a foundation that may not have the same process structure um, and and I guess pro like process and structure that's actually bring capital and those dollars in. And so just really understanding where you're get, gathering capital from is so important um, in order to understand if that relationship is what's needed for the intervention that you have to address hopefully the problem and not the symptom. Mm. Love yeah, that. I, I, th I think to, to you know, Dominic's point, and, you know, when I think about the question, usually I talk to people about it in terms of um, it depends on what you're trying to build and what you're trying to do. So some types of capital are more appropriate for some types of things. Um, sometimes we try to do like this, well, you can use this for, for whatever you're doing, but you, you can't. I, I think you know it's important for founders, entrepreneurs to be clear about what it is they're trying to build and then that will start to lay the, the the path for, okay, based on what I'm trying to build, this is the capital that I need to access. So then this is what I need to do to prepare for that capital. Because each one, you know, to Dominic's point, each one has its own requirements and things that you have to be able to, to, to show. So I, I think where I've often seen the bigger issue is people not really being clear on what it is they want to build and then understanding what that means in terms of the capital they, they, they need to raise or the type of capital. Got it. Yeah, I'll piggyback on that, on that, that the type of capital, because Forward Cities is um, doing something a little different. We're thinking about this from a holistic lens. Uh, and so not just financial capital. And so if you think about this idea that um, entrepreneurs, business, any business, it's about what money do you have coming in the door uh, in terms of capital? Um, what money and and market opportunities? How much are you spending, right? And then that leads to what you got left for your profit, right? And so we're thinking about from a from an ecosystem perspective, what are ways that we can actually increase not only the capital that's coming in, but how as an ecosystem can you reduce expenses for for a business so that they actually take more profit? Uh, and profit for the entrepreneur and not necessarily for investors, right? 
And so we think about holistic capital from the standpoint of uh, the intellectual capital of the entrepreneur, what are they bringing to the table, social capital uh, for from peers uh, and for people who can make introductions uh, to the right folks. We think about ph philanthropic capital feeding into the ecosystem, corporate capital for, um, you know, equitable procurement. Um, we think about how can you also uh, uh, think about how you are reducing your expenses by uh, sharing sharing resources with other businesses, right? Uh, there are any number of ways that you can utilize a network to actually reduce costs and spending for a business in a way that allows them to, to take home more capital. And that is a holistic community solution for businesses that we call E3 Capital um, that we think has a lot of potential. Um, this, is, this is what Black Wall Street was built on. Like, uh, and how do you also keep money circulating in black and brown communities longer by using other black and brown businesses for your services as opposed to going outside? And and so if we can get back to the the tenants of Black Wall Street, I think we have we have a, a lot of potential to build on from a capital perspective. Wow. Thank you all for sharing your perspective, your wisdom with us today. I want to bring us to a close and just ask if you all have any parting words for our participants in the summit today. I mean, you all have shared so many gems uh, and I mean, I feel like we could keep going and going and going. So I just want to quickly have you all just offer some closing remarks. What's what's the big takeaway for people today? I'll go with what uh, Hustle Winston Salem just posted in the chat, and that is utilize a network. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's it. I think we have to be get much more creative around how we tap into ne our networks. Um, there, there is capital in the network. Okay. Sylvester, Dominic. Dominic, I thought you were going to jump out there. I'm going to go for it. You got it. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to echo what Faye said. Um, it's a conversation I have a lot. Like, you have to tap into your networks and use your networks um, because that's probably going to be the biggest asset that you that you have. All right. Yes, I definitely agree, one hundred percent. And not and not to just you know to, to continue to you know moving forward, but yeah, you know, I, I think it's just a reality of you know if you're an ESO, a founder, or an innovator out there, do the due diligence. Like, take the time to listen. Uh, you know, and whether you live through a conversation, listening through data, um, do that time, right? Uh, furthermore, I was speaking to a founder and a group this morning around just don't be afraid to stumble, right? Like as you as you're going after it, sometimes inaction is what prohibits us from actually seeing certain things done. And so we live by something that is internal to us, which is hey, just don't think different, act different, right? And more that you can be the, push forward the great action with the due diligence of the listening, taking that data, putting it together, and just not being scared to stumble and get 2% better. AJ, I promise you, you're, you're going to make gains in the work that you're doing. Um, and use us, like use the network. The people like that are doing this work, um, all of us on this panel, we, we definitely reach out to others as well. Uh, and so just don't be afraid to do that. Sometimes close really don't get fed so seriously love it thank you all this was amazing uh i don't know if the participants are feeling as inspired and empowered and refreshed by the work that you're doing as i am but i can tell you that you all have really made a difference today like this summit is infinitely better because you were here and so thank you for the continued work that you do in the world and to really uplift our communities. So, so grateful for your time. I wish you the absolute best. Hustle will always be a resource for you and welcome you back. Uh, so with that, we're gonna wrap up folks and, and bid you. our panelists adieu. Uh, much love to you all. Look forward to connecting with you too. And now, you know we all gonna have to work together now because now we can <laughs> put it out. Oh boy, <laughs> That's how this all stuff, that's the stuff we thought anyway, it's like. Oh, okay, great. We've been meeting to connect for a while. Now we're on a panel together. So. It's happening. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, right. everybody.